electric guitar. Ukulele. Classical guitar. Wes Anderson crafts his own fantasy world with mise-en-scene modeled after a classic New England island in his film Moonrise Kingdom. Twelve-year-old lovers Sam Shikusky and Susie Bishop escape the confines of adult reality to live in peace and innocence of adolescent love. Anderson utilizes mise-en-scene through eccentric colors, costume design, and quirky acting to provide nuance to a pre-established Rhode Island landscape in order to construct his concept of anti-realist fantasy. In doing so, Anderson's use of mise-en-scene serves as the ultimate juxtaposition between Sam's fantasy world and the adult structure of reality as seen through Susie's perspective. As for Anderson's use of color, yellow is established in Sam's story universe while red appears in real adult world situations. While the colors may not be direct symbols, they serve as motifs which help the viewer situate in each story world. One could imagine the importance of Anderson's color choice to the overall limitations of action and frame to completely contradict realism. Ultimately, Anderson uses this mise-en-scene to position the viewer into different story worlds. The film opens with a shot of a red house painting and a quick capture of yellow colored items before ending the tracking shot atop the stairs. This use of red for the house color establishes us in the adult world, which in this case is Susie's house run by her parents. This connects the color red to Susie's restricted freedom versus the wide open campsite of the duo's new land, which is run by them and also bound by yellow colored items. While Sam is taking inventory of their items, Susie pulls out the red scissors. This subtle hint suggests to the audience that the adult world may soon make another appearance. Despite the fact that Susie never clarified that they were red, the slight reveal of the color through the camera identifies red as that potentially of the real adult world. In reality, weapons are usually connected to real consequences and the same goes for adults. It is no coincidence that Susie only shows the red scissors. The indication of motifs through meets on sun forces one to connect the color with the scissors and note that the scissors may be used in a more serious manner. While the world of youth has held power for most of the film, now comes a sign of the adult world once again, as Mr. Bishop aligns himself within the Red Ribbon, as if to position himself as a the authoritative figure. It becomes apparent in the shot that Mizansen acts as a boundary by building on the metaphor that Red Ribbons keep him locked in the space while Sam and Susie endure the freedom of childhood fantasy. The red motif does not reappear until halfway through the film when the two are met by the scouts. It appears in the off-screen stabbing, yet delivered through an image on the screen of scissors before capturing the two, overlooking the dead dog under the red fletchings of the arrow. These red items bring the childhood fantasy back into reality as a harmless escape turns into an assault by scissors. The indication of the red scissors in the flash image reveals the assaulter without framing them, thus proving the power of mise-en-scene. After a long tracking shot through the house, the camera stops at Susie in the same position four times as she looks toward the camera with her binoculars. Later in the film, Sam asks why she uses them, and which she replies. It helps me see things closer, even if they're not very far away. I pretend. pretend. To have power. The perfect word. The word gives us a lens into the childhood fantasy and allows the viewer to understand the binoculars as her coping mechanism to distance herself from the normative adult reality into childhood fantasy story world. Although. Sam does not have a specific object to cope with, one could imagine Anderson constructed him in this flowery, poetic essence to distance him from his peers, who seem all too interested in the camaraderie and structure of their scout troop. In turn, Anderson's focus on acting as another element of mise-en-scene is revealed, especially with Sam, whose wandering mind and countless facts leave the viewer wondering if that's his coping mechanism or Film critic Chetwin Kelly says Wes Anderson uses mise en scène to form a connection for the audience to the character and the storyline of the film. He uses these elements to indicate and dramatize his fantasy world and engross his audience within it. This reiterates the concept of mise en scène serving as true factors that separate Anderson's film from realism. Instead, he uses these to showcase a world that doesn't seem too abnormal, yet uses the symmetry of costume and playful acting to establish his own spin in a self-reflexive tone. One could see this mise-en-scene element of acting played out in Edward Norton's boyish performance as Scoutmaster Ward. This childlike acting aligns him with Sam, and despite his age, he is part of Sam's childhood fantasy. 
Ward's insistent on being one of the boys is illustrated through his master peril and ability to see past Sam's quirkiness, for he too is seen as an outcast in the adult world. Master Ward, I am very sad to inform you I can no longer be involved with the Khaki Scouts in North America. The rest of the troop will probably be glad to hear this. It is not your fault. Best wishes, Sam Chikuff. This approval in Sam's letter directly before his escape asserts Scoutmaster Ward into his fantasy world, using the acting as their connection. Here, but I don't like the name. Me neither. Furthermore, Christopher Smale writes that Anderson loves symmetry in his movies, and you can see this through costume design. Ultimately, his characters become living, breathing parts of the mise en scène in his film. Immediately, one can see this symmetry played out in the two wearing white. Anderson creates fantasy through use of mise en scène in order to build a world that looks real, but just enough self constructed to allow anomalous costumes and aesthetics to rise to the forefront and give his film this fairy tale feel. The viewer finds themselves incorporated to the film as costume choice and acting reveal current trends of the time period he's redefining, in this case the 60s. The slight alteration of Sam's scout uniform is Anderson's way of embodying Sam's dreamlike being to further distance him from the other scouts whom he doesn't seem to fit in. This can also be seen in the decision to minimally dress Sam and Susie in the dance scene. This radical view of children in an adult situation develops a clash between the real and fantasy world, which makes the viewer feel uncomfortable for these actions are being associated with children. In an interview, Anderson recalls his costume and acting decision by saying, I want to bring the story to life. I remember what it was like for someone that age when they fell in love. It almost becomes some kind of fantasy. You want the fantasy to be reality so much that you start to kind of imagine it is. The indication of the fantasy world as the believed real world plays into Anderson's construction of anti-realism. He is admitting that the perspective of the film is through a child, which is contingent with the argument that the worlds are juxtaposing each other. At the film's end, we find Sam in the same room as Susie, back at her parents' house. As the camera turns to face Susie, it is revealed that she's wearing a yellow dress. This battle that exists through the entire movie of adult and childhood world is finally at peace as Anderson's well-constructed mise-en-scene suggests Susie's metaphorical and physical escape through Sam and his fantasy story world. Through costume design, color indication, and abnormal acting from young children, Anderson sculpts his perfect fantasy to set the contradiction between children and adults just as he does for fantasy and realism while posing a forbidden love escape with children to enforce his fantasy, thus breaking down realist codes.